pray. Father, we come now to your enlightening word, and Lord, we pray that you would send the light into our souls as we open, study, and take in your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, John chapter 4, verse 28. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and said to the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore said his disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, look on the fields, they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit into life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth, another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. Many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, he told me all that ever I did. So when the Samaritans were come to him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. Many more believed because of his own word, and said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. So we're in the middle of a history of a conversion of a lost Samaritan woman at a well, as we've seen at Sychar. And we've seen how the disciples were just shocked to find that their master, the Lord Jesus Christ, was speaking with a less than honorable woman of Samaria. In, 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 in verse 27, you can really feel the shock when it says, Upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman, yet no man said, What seeketh thou, or why talkest thou with her? What the disciples did not understand is that what, and they, what they were about to understand and were going to understand is that gra the grace of God, the gospel, it knows no bounds. And, is, and, and, and it, it is like the song says, it reaches to the highest mountain. It flows to the lowest valley. And when those disciples came back, saw their master, saw the Lord Jesus speaking to the Samaritan woman, they were seeing how the gospel and the grace of God was reaching to the lowest valley. And what they were seeing was a marvelous revelation which Christ told the woman that he was the Messiah. That was a revelation to her in verses 25 and 26 when the woman said, I know that Messiah is coming. He's going to tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I that speak unto thee am he. Now, he didn't have to put it that way. He could have just said, uh, I'm, I'm Messiah or I am he. But he added this part, I that speak unto thee. And that was the way that Christ revealed to her that he was the Messiah. And it was so typical of Christ because what he was really saying is that Look, in the course of us speaking, in the course of me speaking, in the course of you listening, that, you, that, you, that you're going to understand in the course of the conversation. And then she says in verse 19, verse 19, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. But the more she listened to him speak to her, the more her eyes were being opened so that he, that he, he could see what, not just a prophet, He's the Messiah. And it was the way he put that. It was the way that was so typical of how he reveals himself when he said in verse 26, he said, I that speak, I am, uh, I that, I who are, uh, speak, I who am speaking to you right now am he. As long as she didn't reject him, as long as she didn't turn away from him, as long as she kept listening to him, the more it was revealed to her as to who Jesus Christ really is. And that's where we find our application. What is it that will cause us to subtly turn away from Jesus Christ and from Revelation? What is it that will cause us to stop talking with Christ 
or God in prayer and stop listening to him in the Bible? What is it that will make other things so much more important than us taking our time to open the Bible? What it is, is Luke 10.41. Luke 10.41, Jesus answered to Senator Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. What is it that, that in our lives makes the many things so much more important, so much more pressing, so much more urgent than listening to Christ and talking to him, listening to Christ in the Bible and talking to him in prayer? I like to think of it, and, and I've told you this before, uh, 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 like my little grandson. When my little grandson, little Joshua, was a little guy, he was only about four years old, and he was in the garage with his dad, and uh, that's where the washer and dryer was, and, and the little guy had taken a handful of gravel and threw it into the, it was actually the dryer, he threw it into the dryer. So the dryer is going around, and the little guy was enjoying all the noise the gravel was making, and and his father knew what he did, and so his father said, Joshua, and, 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 I, and, and I'll never forget the scene. Joshua just put his hands, in, little Joshua put his hands in his pocket and says, I don't want to talk about that right now. <laughs> he said, I don't want to talk about that right now. <laughs> oh, man. It, it, it was little Joshua's sin of throwing the gravel in the dryer that made him walk away and say, I don't want to talk about that right now. There was going to be no conversation between that four-year-old little Joshua and his dad unless they did talk about that right now. And that was the test. It was to address his sin that made the difference between there going to be a conversation between the four-year-old boy and his dad or not. And further conversation between that four-year-old little guy and his dad, it hit a roadblock. And the roadblock was over throwing the gravel in the dryer. And, and that was the test with this woman at the well. When the conversation between the woman and Christ hit a roadblock, the Samaritan woman and Christ were having a great conversation. Oh, it couldn't have been better from verses 7 to 15. I mean, she was, he was telling her about the great living water that would take away all of her inner thirst of her life, and she was loving it, and she was drinking up the conversation. It was great. She was so interested in this water of life that, was, that could be inside of her, supply her like a fountain. She'd be so happy in life. And then Christ told her that if she only knew that, 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 that who was making that offer to her, that he was the gift of God, and then all she had to do was just ask for that water, and without hesitation, the water would be given her. In verse 10, verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst ask to him, and he would have given thee living water. And the woman jumped when she heard that all she had to do was ask for that wonderful water, and it would be done and, and for free. And her jump was, verse 15, Verse 15, the woman saith to him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. This was the greatest conversation this woman ever had in life, and this woman felt that she, they were moving on to wonderful subjects, and she can't wait for even the next subjects, but then no sooner did she ask for that living water that there and then was this tremendous roadblock in the conversation. The roadblock was simply... Verse 16, verse 16, Jesus saith there unto her, Go, call thy husband, come hither. Now, when Christ asked her to go bring her husband, Christ touched on the most sensitive subject in her life, her sexual history. And at, and, and at first, the woman tried to deflect the subject. In verse 17, verse 17, she answered and said, I have no husband. With that statement, the woman was saying, Let's not talk about that subject, about my husband. I, I, I like it so much better if we can just continue about the subjects like living water, taking away my thirst, giving me incredible 
satisfaction in life? Can we just keep talking about those wonderful things that I can get for free by just asking? That's what I want to talk about. But Christ said, no. Let's stay on the subject of your husband. And Christ hit the nerve in this woman when Christ said to her in verse, verse 17 and 18, verse 17 and 18, the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that thou saidest truly. When he said that in verse 18, thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou hast is not thy husband, you could hear the screech on the wheels on the road as the conversation that, that just, it came to a screeching halt, stop moving, as Christ brought up this tremendous roadblock of her sexual sins of, of adultery and fornication. Now, Christ had, had, had just brought up the gravel that she threw in the dryer, and now the Samaritan woman is placed with a place she has a choice. She could have walked away and said, I don't want to talk about that right now. And, and if she had done that, she, that would have been the end of the conversation with Christ. There would have been, that it, it, it would have been, uh, it, 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 there would have been no living water to satisfy her deeper thirst. There would have been no life for that woman to be washed from her sins. There would have been no forgiveness for her sins. There would have been no new life from her dead death. It all hinged on whether that woman's response uh, 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 to, the, to the, the husbands of one of the, the six men that she had an intimate life with, and, 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 and it, it all hinged on everything with her future, her eternal future, hinged on whether or not she decided to walk away and say, I don't want to talk about that right now. Or if this woman would stay with Christ on that and say, okay, let's talk about it right now. And this is the great triumph of this woman was that she didn't walk away and say, I don't want to talk about it right now. The great triumph is when she stayed there in verse 19 and she said, sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet, verse 19. That was a tremendous victory for that woman where she stayed with Christ and actually drew closer to Christ. And with that statement about her believing that Christ was a prophet, the woman is saying, as a prophet, I know you see everything with the eyes of God. You caught me, and I surrender to you as a prophet. And with that statement about her believing that Christ was a prophet, that woman was saying to Christ that she was willing for Christ to reshape her, her understanding about life, including what mountains she should worship on, etc. That was a tremendous triumph for this woman when she made this, when, when, when the subject of her sins was brought up, she didn't walk away. She didn't walk away because she didn't want to address her sins. And this is the answer to all those questions in our lives. What is it that will cause us to suddenly walk away from Christ? What is it that causes us to stop going to him in prayer and listening to him in the Bible? What is it that makes other things so much more important than spending time with God. It's the roadblocks that Christ raises in our lives that block our any further communication with Christ. It's Christ saying to us, what about this sin that has to be dealt with? And that's the point of our decision whether or not we're going to turn to Christ like the woman did and say, I surrender and I'm willing to, to do what, what, what it has to be done to make it right. This is... What, what, what Paul said to Christ. After Christ brought up a subject of Paul's sin of persecuting Christ and kicking against these thorns and, that God had put in his life, and Paul did not turn away from God when, 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 when Christ revealed to, 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 to Paul that, that he was God and that he was in disobedience. But what happened in Acts 9.3, Acts 9.3, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. Suddenly there shined about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? For the woman, it was, it was, it, it, it was when she acknowledged to Christ 
that he was a prophet and that she was guilty of the sin that, that, uh, that he had brought up, that her relationship with Christ really took off. And it flourished as she submitted to Christ. For Paul, it was when Christ brought up to Paul that he was persecuting Christ, when he was persecuting believers, and it was that Paul did not turn away and walk away saying, I don't want to talk about that, which would have stopped any hope for Paul to have a relationship with God. But was Paul acknowledged that Christ was God, it was when he acknowledged that Christ was God, when he acknowledged he was guilty of the sin of persecuting Christ, that his relationship with Christ took off and flourished as he submitted in surrender in Acts 9, 6 to, to Christ when he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And same is true with us. Same is true with us. When we slip up and we fail with a sin, it's our time to, to, to not walk away from God. I don't want to talk about it right now. And because that woman did not walk away from Christ when the subject of her sin was brought up, it, that she continued to speak. And that's why he said in verse 26, verse 26, I that speak unto thee. I, in other words, he's saying, I that am continuing to speak to you. I that am I, and conversing because you didn't walk away. I am showing you now that I am the Messiah. And, and it was, it's in this process of listening to Christ that she would know that Christ was the Messiah and the great I Am. And in the same way, Christ told the man who was born blind and Christ restored his sight it, that it was during the time that the man was looking at Christ and it was at the time that the man was listening to Christ, that's when it was revealed to him that Jesus was Messiah and God the Son, and God the Son. That's John 9.35, John 9.35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? Jesus said unto them, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. See, what Christ was saying there was that it, 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 you are now seeing him and you are now talking with him that the man had revealed to him that he was God. It was in that process of seeing and talking. And the same is true with us. We gain more and more assurance that Christ is God and Christ is the Messiah the more we turn our eyes upon Jesus in his word and look at him and the more we listen to him in his word. And this is a wonderful passage here in John chapter 4 about this Samaritan woman because we learn so much about how revelation happens to a person. It's during the process of conversing and, and focusing. Also, we learn in this passage great principles about evangelism as we see how Christ drew this woman into conversion from her sin to being cleansed from being from, and, and forgiven and when, from being in darkness to light, from being in death to life. Um, <clears throat> next week, I think it's next week, let me think about the times. Yeah, next week. On Monday, February 5th, uh, Juan Tirada, uh, I, I asked Juan Tirada and he agreed. Juan Tirada is a master fisherman in Loreto. And, he, and he, he agreed to come on my boat for a day and teach me how to fish for a grouper in the rocks that are deep drop 700 feet below the surface of the water. Now, I know how to catch Dorado, or mahi-mahi as you call it, on the surface of the water. I know how to catch snapper. I know how to catch triggerfish in the rocks that are about 40 feet under the water. I know how to catch rockfish that are 700 feet under the water. But I don't know how to catch grouper that are, that are hiding out in, the, in between the rocks at 700 feet under the water. And so I need Juan to, to come with me for the day and teach me that skill. I need to learn how, I need to learn several things. I need to learn how to use the sonar to even see the rocks that are 700 feet below the surface. And I need to learn how, how to, to, to get those fish to come out of those rocks to, so I can get them. And I, learned to, I need to learn this from the master fisherman, Juan Tirada. He's going to come. Okay. 
So Christ told his disciples in Matthew 4.19, Matthew 4.19, he saith unto them, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Now, the disciples were fishermen. They didn't need to be taught how to, be, how to teach how to fish for fish. They, they could teach others how to fish for fish. But those men needed to learn how to fish for men. So what Christ was telling them was that he was going to be like Juan is going to be for me on Monday, those a week from Monday. Those fishermen of fish didn't know how to fish for men, and so Christ told them in, in Matthew 4, 19, that he would teach them how to fish for men, just like Juan's going to teach me how to deep drop fish for grouper in the rocks. And it's this passage here in, in John 4 with the Samaritan woman where we can see the skill of the master fisherman for, for men uh, 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 with this Samaritan woman. The first thing that Ron is going to show me is, um, is, is how to set the hook in the live mackerel bait and how to lower that bait and present it to attract the grouper to, to come out of the rocks. And what we see in this passage is how Jesus presented the bait to this Samaritan woman as he presented to her the bait of the living water to attract her to that bait. This is verse 10. In verse 10, when, when he said, uh, If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith that he give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, he would have given thee living water. And then Juan is going to teach me how to patiently wait for the grouper to come out of those deep rocks and show an interest in the bait. You can't force them out. And sometimes we can f fish in the sonar and, 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 um, and I can see lots of fish down there, but they're showing no interest at all in the bait. It happens many times. Why? There's nothing wrong with the bait. There's nothing wrong with the bait. It's the fish are not hungry. And, and when there's been, for example, as there is right now, full moon, uh, uh, the fish that have light all night long shining on the surface of the water, and they eat all night long, so they gorge themselves, and so they're not hungry for your bait, and they don't show any interest. Nothing wrong with your bait. It's just the fish. It's not you. It's them. And sometimes when we present that beautiful bait of cleansing from sin and forgiveness of sin and peace with God and assurance of heaven, etc., sometimes the law show no interest at all. There's nothing wrong with the gospel it's how, or, or how we're presenting the good news. The problem is there's no hunger, there's no thirst in those people we're presenting it to, and there's nothing we can do to change that. And, and you, you know, it's like the saying: you can lead a horse to water, but you cannot get the horse. You can't give the horse. You can't make the horse thirsty and give him water to drink. So he, so you, so you, you can't force him to drink water. And then Juan's going to teach me that when I feel those little tuggings on the line, those are nibbles. They, he's going to teach me do nothing. Just let the fish eat the bait, so that the hook ends up in the mouth of the fish. And he's gonna, and Juan's gonna teach me that that if you jerk the line too soon, and you try to set the hook too early in the corner of their mouth, that you end up pulling the hook away from the fish, and you spook the fish, and you lose the fish. And in this patience, we see the the Samaritan woman nibble on the bait, it, it, and that's what we see with Christ in, in the inner interplay in in verses thirteen of. 14, verse 13 to 14, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinks this water shall thirst again. Whosoever drinks the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And then the woman says, well, you don't have anything to draw it out from, and the water, the well is deep. Those are nibbles. Those are she, she's, she's saying, I'm interested, but, you know, I'm not there yet. And then when Christ said to the woman, Christ was when Christ, sorry, when the woman was saying that, it said Christ was letting her eat the bait. He didn't try to jerk the bait and, and set the hook too early and scare the woman off. He just waited until the woman had the hook in her mouth, which she did when the woman said to him in verse 15, verse 15, the, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come here to drink. And then Juan's going to teach me when you, you take the jerk on the line and set the hook in the corner of the mouth of the fish. Not too early, 
So you don't pull the hook away from the fish, not too late, so that the fish is, is eating and all of a sudden he realizes there's a hook there and he spits the hook out of his mouth. That's too late. But just at the right time, he's going to teach me how, how, when to set the hook. And Christ didn't, didn't set the gospel hook too early it, when the woman just came to the well. He didn't open the conversation uh, with the woman by saying, to, by saying to her, and how many husbands and non-husbands have you had? That would have been too early, would have scared the woman off. And he didn't wait too long to set the hook where the woman may have lost interest in the living water. But just at the right moment, he set the hook, and when he set the hook was in verse 17, verse 17, when, uh, when, when Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. Thou hast had five husbands, and he who am thou now hast is not thy husband, and that saidest thou truly. And when he said that to her about her husbands, he set the hook, and she was hooked. And she said in verse 19, she said in verse 9, Sir, I perceive thou art a prophet. Now, when she said that, he's reeling her in. He's reeling her in, and he's already reeling her in to to acknowledge he's a prophet, and he's, she's going to obey him, and then she's, she, she's going to realize he's the Messiah. And, and uh, from what she says, then she's even intimating, and the men believe he's the Savior of the world. These are the fisher of men skills that Christ was going to teach his disciples when he said in Matthew 4, 19, that he was going to make them fishers of men. And then, so, so, so anyway, so there was... Christ harvesting the soul of the Samaritan woman when the disciples left the Lord to go into the city because they were hungry to, to get some food. And we can see the disciples as they're going into the city to get food. And they're traveling because around the city were the, were the, uh, the fields that were planted. So they're traveling through the fields probably wheat fields. And we can just imagine the conversation between the hungry disciples as they're saying, oh, they're saying things like, oh, we sure are hungry, and it sure would be nice if we could, as we've done in the past, just pull off some of these wheat and, and, and get the wheat and then pop them into our, into our mouths. That would sure be pretty nice if we could pluck some of that nice wheat and eat it right now. And then we can imagine another disciple responding and says, yes, that would really be nice, but the only problem is that this wheat is, is still not ripe, and, it's not, it, 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 and we can't eat it. And we can imagine another disciple saying, yep, and there are four months left, and then comes the harvest. Now, that was the end of that conversation as the disciples just moved on, and, 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 and the disciples thought, that, well, we're the only ones having this conversation about the wheat and, and when it's going to be ready to harvest. Only the disciples, what they did not understand is that they were not the only ones for the, that, that were there for that conversation. And the disciples found that out, that they weren't alone during that conversation when they returned from the city with the food. And Jesus said to them in verse 35, verse 35, Say not ye... There are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Now, when Christ said that in verse 35, verse 35, say not there are yet, say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. We can see the shock in the eyes of the disciples as they as they look surprised at each other, and, and, one of, and, and, and they said, everybody says to themselves, I thought Jesus was at the well when we were alone in the field together. But he heard our conversation about, about there being four months left before the harvest. And we can see each one of those disciples saying to himself, who is this Jesus? He's everywhere. He's seeing every act of every person. He's hearing every conversation. He's knowing every thought of everybody. And the disciples realize that Jesus is God. He is the God. He is God that David wrote about in Psalm 139.7. Psalm 139.7, where David said, 
Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Whither shall I free, flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about thee, about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, the night shineth as the day, the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. So when Christ referenced their private conversation between themselves about the time of the harvest, they were convinced Christ is God. Just as when Christ referenced a private time when, when, uh, when a Nathaniel, with a Nathaniel that convinced Nathaniel that he was God, John 147, John 147, Jesus uh, saw Nathanael coming to him and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed is he in whom is no guile. Nathanael saith unto him, From where do you know me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, or God the Son. Thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, unto him. Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou, thou shalt see greater things than these. For us, what does that mean for us? That means that us, that our Lord Jesus Christ is everywhere at the same time, knows everything about every person. There's nothing we can do that's hidden from Christ. There is no thought that we can think that he doesn't know about. There's no place in the universe that where we can be alone without him. And Christ did not reference that com private conversation between them just to impress them that he was there. He used the conversation about the time of harvest to challenge the disciples in verse 35, verse 35, when he said, Say not ye there yet four months, and then come of the harvest. Behold, I say unto thee, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white to harvest. When he said to his disciples, they are white already to harvest, he was referring to those group of men who were now approaching from the city as a result of the testimony of the woman. And just as the ripening process of the wheat is a process of the wheat slowly becoming whiter and whiter, Christ was telling his disciples that as they looked out and saw those men getting closer and closer to Christ, the harvest was whitening before their eyes. Now, what's wonderful about how Christ took that conversation of the disciples about the time of harvest and transformed it to a conversation about when souls are going to be ready to be brought home to God is that it shows how Christ wants to work with us in our daily lives. We wake up each morning we open our eyes from sleep. We're waking up to what Christ is saying, this is going to be a wonderful new day for you in which, in which you are going to be brought into situations and adventures in this day that are going to engage you. And it's those situations and adventures in our lives of, of the novel and the new, like hunger and harvest, that Christ wants to take and transform into great teachings about unseen things, spiritual things. In other words, God wants to take what we are tempted to call mundane, like being hungry and having to wait for a harvest, that can seem so routine and mundane, boring. He wants to take situations like that in our lives and make them monumental points of instructive illustrations that, that make, it, make us to more understand what we can't see, like the hungers of the soul and trusting Christ in conversion. And that's what takes a boring life and makes it an exciting life. When we're willing to become like a child, like a baby with those big, big eyes wide open and their necks are turning their heads back and forth, those big eyes of that baby are saying, 
I just can't take in enough of this new world around me. It's so interesting. It's also instructive. It's also new. That's what Christ meant when he said in Matthew 18, 13, 18, 3. Matthew 18, 3. And he said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. When we came to Christ, we were born again. And that means that we became like a, like a baby right when it's born. Big eyes, taking in everything is new, learning about everything for the first time. And this is what the Bible means when it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That statement in 2 Corinthians 5.17, 2 Corinthians 5.17 about all things are become new, it means that, <clears throat> you know, I used to think that being hungry and walking through a field and not be able to eat because I had, had to wait for the harvest was only about being hungry and walking through a field and not being able to eat because I had to wait for the harvest. But after I've been born again, now walking through a field and being hungry and not being able to eat because I had to wait for the harvest is about being hungry to see souls saved and me now looking for the souls that are ready to be harvested. Now, Christ then, when he's speaking on this subject about harvesting souls, he references rewards in verse 36. He says, He that reapeth <coughs> receiveth wages and gathereth the fruit eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. So what he's saying here, Christ is saying, is he's saying, I'm the owner of the field. He's the owner of the field of the world of people. And Christ sees people as souls that need to be, that need to have seeds sown in them, and they need to, 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 to be harvested, to be brought home to God. And he doesn't want any person to be left out of heaven. 2 Peter 3, 9, 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. 1 Timothy 2.4, 1 Timothy 2.4, the Lord is, will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. That means there's not one person in his field of the world that Christ does not want to be saved, contrary to Calvinism. And Christ sends us into his field to work the field. Now, not everybody's a reaper in the field. Not everybody leads vast numbers of souls to Christ like Billy Graham did. Not everybody is the, uh, verse, 36, 34, verse 36, he that reapeth. Some are sowers. Some are sowers. Verse 36, verse 36, he that soweth. What he meant was that there are some who only sow seeds and they speak of Christ and they do not bring souls to their knees to receive Christ and uh, harvest the soul. And then there are those who do bring those to their knees to receive Christ. They are the harvesters. But whether a person is a sower of seeds or a reaper of the fruit, Christ made it clear, both will be rewarded. Both will be paid. A reaper cannot reap souls unless there was a sower to have put that seed in there. A sower of seeds cannot hope for the, for the, for the fruit to be gathered unless there's a harvester. Both are essential, and this is what Christ meant when he said in verse 36, verse 36, both he that reapeth, soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. One will not be valued over another. The harvester will not be valued over the reaper. All will be seen as necessary. All will be seen as working together in verse 37, verse 37, and herein is that saying true, one soweth, another reapeth. The scene here was that Christ has labored, worked hard to convert that Samaritan woman. That woman then goes into the city. She labors. She works hard to convert the men of the city. And now those men who were worked on by the woman 
who was worked on by Christ are now coming, and the disciples are there just in time now to bring those men into the kingdom. The disciples are there to harvest those men who are the result of the work of the woman, and the woman is the result of the work of Christ. In other words, those men were able, were, were, were about to harvest those, the, the, those disciples, were about to harvest the men that they bestowed no work on. And this is what Christ meant when he said to his disciples in verse 38, verse 38, I sent you to reap that whereon you bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. What he's saying there in verse 38, verse 38, when he says, other men labored, and you entered into their labors, he meant that he labored on that woman. He worked on that woman so she could be saved. And that woman worked on those men so they could be saved. And those disciples, they were just reaping what Christ and the woman had worked so hard on. What does that mean for us? When a person finally comes to receive Christ, that's the end of a long chain of work of other people. Show me a person who's receiving Christ, and I'll show you a person that has a history of others working to bring him to that point of receiving Christ. I've been working, on my Jew, I've been working with my Jewish friend to come to Christ, and I thought I was the only believer in his life. But then he shared with me how another close friend of him has been urging him to come to Christ. And the greatest worker of all is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works on people to convict people of just how righteous God is and just how sinful the sinner is. The Holy Spirit works to convict people that the end of the life on earth is not the end of existence. There really is an eternal heaven. There really is an eternal hell. And we, when we work to be a helper for lost souls to find their way to come home to God, we're co-workers with many, including the Holy Spirit, who've all contributed on working on that soul to bring that soul to the birth of becoming born again. The work of God on a soul is a process where the word of God on a soul is, it just starts growing deeper and deeper and deeper into that soul. Just like seed, good seed that lands on good ground, the seed is cast onto the surface of that ground, and then the roots of that seed just grow deeper and deeper and deeper into the ground. Okay, now, here comes these Samaritan men. They're coming to be saved, and the first thing they do is tell why they've come to Christ, which is in verse 39, verse 39. Many of the Samaritans of the city believed on him, they are saved, for the saying of the woman which testified, he told me ever I did. Those Samaritan men are believing on Christ for one and only one reason, and it's because of verse 39, the saying of the woman which testified, he told me all that ever I did. They believed her testimony. They believed themselves into Christ because of the testimony of that woman. When the woman told those men that Christ had told her everything about her and that he has to be the Messiah, those men believed into Christ from that. Those, those men did not say to the woman, well, that's fine for you, but we need to see for ourselves. We need to evaluate this Jesus for ourselves, and then we might believe. No, just from the testimony of that woman, those men believed themselves into Jesus. Those men did not say to the woman, we need to see proof like those at the cross in Matthew 27, 42. Matthew 27, 42, who said, he saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. Those were saying that if they, if they saw Christ come down from the cross, then they would believe. These men of Samaria were saying, we don't need to see anything. We, all we need to do is hear the testimony of the woman. That's enough for us. We'll believe. And Jesus did not have to say to, to, to those men of Samaria what he say, will say a few verses below 
in verse 48, verse 48, then said Jesus unto him, except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Those men never saw signs and wonders. Those men never saw any miracles by Christ. Those men believed without seeing any miracles performed. Without, they just believed because of the testimony of the woman. The only evidence those men needed was the testimony of that woman's faith. That was all the evidence that those men needed. Her faith was enough evidence for them to believe. Just like it says in Hebrews 11.1, 1, Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And when those men heard that woman's testimony, those men said about her faith, Hebrews 11.1, 1, Hebrews 11.1, 1, her faith is the substance of what I've hoped for. When those men heard that woman's testimony, those men said about her faith, Hebrews 11.1, 1, her faith is all the evidence I need of things not seen. And that's why those men, by believing, just because of the woman's testimony, put themselves in a group of those who believe without seeing, as Jesus said to Thomas in John 20, 29, John 20, 29, Jesus saith unto Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. That Samaritan woman, those Samaritan men, show us that there are those with a faith that doesn't have to see. They have that kind of response to the Lord Jesus Christ. Others, on the other hand, responded to Christ, wanting Christ just to leave them, go away, as the Gadareans in Luke 8, 7, 37, Luke 8, 37, whole multitude of the country of the Gadareans round about besought him to depart from them, that they were taken with great fear. Some responded to Christ just with a, I don't care, an apathy, and they didn't come to Christ. Some responded to Christ wanting to kill him, as the Herodians and the Pharisees who plotted to destroy him in Luke 19.47. Luke 19.47, he taught daily in the temple, but the chief priest, scribes, and the chief of the people sought to destroy him. But these Samaritan men responded to Christ with verse 40. Verse 40. <clears throat> so when the Samaritans were come unto him, they, they besought him that he would stay with them, tarry with them, and, abo and he abode two days. There's one word to describe the, the interest of those Samaritan men, and it's the word more. Those Samaritan men yearned for more time to spend with Jesus, more time to take in the words of Jesus. They, oh, they, well, well, they wanted more and more. They might as well have sung the song, more about Jesus, more about Jesus would I know, more of his grace to others show, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. More about Jesus on his throne. Riches and glory all his own. More of his kingdom sure increase. More of his coming prince of peace. As we see Christ bringing all those Samaritans out of their darkness to light, we can see Christ as the king of the Jews doing what the Jews were called to do but failed which was they were to be a priest to the whole world and bring the world out of darkness into the light of God. That's what the Jews were called to do. The Jews were called to bring people out of dead observances of religion and into a living relationship with God. But sadly, the Jews slumped into a state of their own darkness, of their own dead religious observances and traditions. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for our master teacher, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the example of that Samaritan woman who didn't walk away. And we thank you for the example of those Samaritan men who just believed the testimony of the women. And we pray, Lord, make us fishers of men in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.